Hi, I'm Anita Walker, Executive Director of the Mass Cultural Council, and welcome to our culture chat today. Lars Torres is joining us from Somerville, where he is the Executive Director of the Artisans Asylum, and welcome to our program today, Lars. Hey, thanks so much, Anita. It's a pleasure. Good afternoon. Now, you just did something very fancy with your Zoom. You know, I'm a real newbie on the Zoom thing, and you have turned your living room into a picture behind you. I don't even know how you do that. But before we explain what in the world is going on, tell us a little about Artisans Asylum. Yeah, happy to. We like to think of ourselves as a uh, about a 42,000 square foot fabrication wonderland. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when you enter a 42,000 square foot space, the scale can be overwhelming. And we double that effect by having about 160 artist studios, all different disciplines, as well as about 15 different workshops where people can make anything. And so I think what makes it a wonderland is when you see the amount of ingenuity and creativity and productivity that's coming out of those 500 members that we have. Give us some examples. What would we see if we were there right now? If you were well, there right now, right you, now. You, tell me, I, not right <laughs> now, like yeah. eight weeks ago, what would we see? Right. Well, you might have seen folks working on robotics. We have a couple of um, sort of startups in the robotics space. You might have also seen some folks preparing for local art shows. You know, we were getting ready for open studios. And so jewelers were building up their inventory, a lot of hammering and fine metal work happening. Um, it is springtime and so people are getting ready for gardening and outdoor work and so you might have seen some people building flower boxes and bird feeders and some of those springtime things. Um, and then you would just would have also seen a lot of folks painting or doing their own individual work. Silk screening is very popular and so as we get ready for the spring shows people are silk screening signs and cards and things like that. And of course um, in the midst of all this wonderful, delightful anticipation of spring. We got something very, very different. And what is amazing to me is how you were able to, we use this word pivot all the time, but I mean, you are like the definition of the word pivot. First of all, talk to me a little bit about, in fact, we were talking before we started our formal broadcast here. Yeah. Um, it sounds like you were sort of uh, looking down the road before a lot of the rest of us were seeing that there could be some potential for um, the Artisans Asylum to be very helpful once this arrived here. Yeah, you know, there's two things that came together in a really powerful way. One is uh, when you have a community of 500 that's surrounded by another 9,000 people um, who care about creativity, who care about, um, to, to varying degrees, entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship, you have this sensing network. And they're always thinking about in what way can we be of service or in what way can we translate our skills and talents into a mechanism or an agent of social change. And so we have this sensing network that's out there. Um, the second thing is that um, we, we are innately problem solvers. And I think that those Sorry, getting a phone call. Um, I think that those two elements um, converged in a very unique way to probably back in late February have people already talking about if and when really COVID hits the US, what can we be doing? Because we were seeing acute shortages in places like Italy and elsewhere. Um, and so people were already talking about how can we put our 3D printers to work? How can we put our laser cutters to work in a way that's of service? Um, because it sounds like the U.S. isn't going to be any better prepared than these other countries. Um, the second thing... I, I just have to say, though, yeah. at that time, I can remember what I was thinking at that time. And I was nowhere near anticipating that we would be anything like where we are today. And you were already thinking about what you were going to do about it. Yeah, I think our members really have to have to have to be the ones to 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 sort of own the credit there. My job is to listen and to be responsive and to help create a framework for action out of 500 unique voices. But really, people were chatting quite early on about what is this going to look like. Um, not only because they travel and people are engaged in the world as they are at the cultural council and elsewhere, but also problems as they flare up tend to be seen as opportunities for innovation. And so that's really what galvanized, I think, our community's interest. So now tell us what you did. 
Well, um, early on, one of our founders, uh, Guy Cavalcanti, started a group called Open Source Medical Devices. And that group quickly grew. Um, that group was sort of surveilling the landscape of need from Italy to the Philippines, you know, and um, we're already starting to make recommendations around um, 3D printed face masks to replace the N95s that were um, being depleted, as well as gowns. Uh, DIY ventilators were coming up as a need. Um, so we looked at those and we very quickly started to engage the local um, healthcare community in conversation about what would be valuable, what would be useful to you. And we heard pretty quickly that folks felt like there were um, probably three top priorities that we should be focusing on. Um, one was the shortage of face shields. Um, face shields being um, a critical gap um, just in terms of the basic safety from um, expelled, um, you know, sputum and things like this onto healthcare workers. And the other was um, hospital gowns, right? These isolation gowns that are used to create some barrier between the patient and the doctor. And then the third were the surgical face masks. And so we decided that we would sort of focus on those three goods and see if we couldn't develop production that would make a meaningful impact in closing the gap, the supply gap. So you are actually producing face masks, hospital gowns, correct? Yeah, we are producing um, in, in the thousands of units, the face shields and the hospital gowns. Uh, what we haven't begun to produce yet are the surgical face masks that just cover the nose and the mouth. Um, it's a pleated item. And so the innovation to actually produce those at scale at a cost that you know, uh, doesn't break our bank, but is affordable and meets the procurement requirements of local providers is something that's taken a little bit longer. Um, but we have sold a couple of the machine parts um, because that was some pretty deep innovation. And I think we're about a week away from really testing a production run of, of finished masks. So this is all happening using the tools and equipment that you have um, in your 42,000 <laughs> square feet of space, right? You're absolutely right, Anita. And the biggest single asset that it's leveraging is the heart and the brains of our members who have, um, you know, spent dozens and dozens of hours figuring out how to make these things that they've never made before, figuring out what tools would be the most efficient um, to achieve a certain outcome. Um, and in some cases, adapting tools or building new tools to help solve those problems. You know, even a jig that enables you to place the foam on a head shield in just the right spot consistently over time is a modest innovation. And yet there's probably a dozen of those that we've had to implement on every production line to be able to get to a place where we're producing 2000 units with reliability and consistency. You know, um, speaking of face masks, I know yeah. there's a lot of individual home innovation going on, yes. <laughs> making your own face mask. Uh, mine is being made out of a pair of socks because I saw it on Facebook. It's probably right on. probably not very high tech but uh, or reproducible, but it was real easy and I didn't need extra parts, just a pair of scissors. Um, yeah, but totally. as you, uh, this is making me think because whenever you put artists to a task, um, not only is it going to get done in a new way, um, but it, it it's probably going to add some improvements that might be adopted in the future. So mm. as you're developing hospital gowns and face masks and, and face shields, are there components or parts or designs or even aesthetics that have been a step up and a step better than what we're used to? That's a great question. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to assess really like the meta landscape of what's happening here. Um, yes, there are some very fine-tuned innovations that have happened along the way. Um, in the case of the face shields, for example, we adopted a design that came out very early from the University of Wisconsin. And we just said, hey, that looks like a winner. You know, it's being used at the University of Wisconsin, great medical center out there and medical community. Um, let's adopt that. And so where our innovation came in wasn't so much in the shield and mask design per se, um, but in optimizing production um, to, you know, just crank out again that consistent, reliable product. So one of our uh, members uh, designed using Autodesk, you know, using a, 
a program like Fusion 360 um, to um, basically create the model of a 3D printed jig that would support then um, the production of the shields. I think when it comes to the fiber arts, this is where we've seen the most innovation and the most kind of really um, um, hard won gains in, product, in, in productivity. One is figuring out the right material for one of these isolation gowns. Um, because right now we face a situation where the dominant, the predominant material is in very, very short supply, right? Um, it's very hard to get it. So we're looking at alternative materials. And one of the ways that we've um, sort of been able to, to source um, this material is through agricultural fabrics, which are the same spun bond polypropylene. Um, and then the question is, well, does it fuse in the same way, you know, because we're creating heat bond um, stitches instead of, you know, sewing them. So our, our team has had to learn how to use an ultrasonic bonder. And in fact, they fixed an old ultrasonic bonder to create the stitching. So what we're finding is almost like the integration of non-traditional tools yeah. into artists' lives. And what I think is going to be really fun, in addition to your very good question that I don't have an answer for, ask me in a month, but is that we're seeing new tools being integrated into artists' consciousness Right, and so the question for me is going to be: When this dies down, how the heck are they going to be using an ultrasonic bonder to make new art that's going to, you know, maybe inflatable art, or who knows? That's going to just kind of transform our cultural experience locally. So it's kind of going in both directions. Absolutely, the artists might be changing the way we look at these medical products, but the making of the medical products will change the way the artist makes the art. Yes. It is kind yeah. of exciting. Before we Absolutely. go on with our conversation, I want to make sure to invite other people, and I know you're out there participating online with this uh, wonderful conversation with Lars from Artisans Asylum in Somerville. Uh, now, if you look on your laptop, there's a little button down there that says QA. And if you push on that, you can send us a comment, you can write a question, you can just give us your reaction to what you're hearing. We absolutely want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to participate, and we do want to hear from you. Um, I want to just pivot again slightly from the conversation that we're having, Lars, because um, you work with hundreds and hundreds, 500 artists, and you were talking at the beginning of our conversation about um, coming into springtime, and this is sort of out of the lean, dark winter where the, the funds start to dry up because there's not as much going on. There aren't shows, there aren't gigs, there isn't a lot of, of work for artists in the wintertime. And so they're really in great anticipation of springtime shows and concerts and venues and everything else that artists get to participate in when the weather warms up. And instead of having that opportunity, we got a door slammed in the face. Tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from the artists at the Artisans Asylum about you know, how they were affected um, financially and otherwise uh, from this crisis. Yeah, it's a heartbreaking uh, set of stories on, on the one hand, right, where artists are making the difficult choice of saying, look, I can't afford my studio, you know, I can't afford my membership, I'm gonna have to put it on hold. So we're doing a lot of sort of just behind the scenes work to manage and negotiate that. Um, we are seeing some artists being able to sort of pivot to the online services. You know, some artists do have um, like a home jewelry set up or they do have an easel at home where they can do painting and they've got an online channel. Um, but honestly, I think um, what we're hearing is that those artists who do have free time are coming in to dedicate a huge amount of heart and soul to this volunteer effort um, without certainty about their future. And what I see is, is the single best thing that I can do is, is two things. One is look for uh, resources, for example, the Arts Emergency Relief Fund and things like this that our artists can take advantage of. And, and when they need support, I'm here to help them complete the applications, whatever. Um, and then the other thing is we're looking at a way to stand up a very modest um, sort of micro grant fund so that you know if an artist can't make rent or it's fine they're finding it difficult to um, pay for just basic needs that we can be there to step in and bridge that with a very very modest um, grant um, but by and large um, there's a few stories at the extreme tail um, I think we're not into the deepest 
part of this impact yet. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're set up to deal with that in May or June when, when the tiny bit of savings runs out or whatever that, you know, when the income that was um, sought from Somerville Open Studios isn't going to be coming in, how we can be supportive. Um, a lot of our um, folks, it sounds to me like, didn't have jobs in the service economy, right, as waiters. They have jobs in other areas. And so many of them have either been able to get unemployment or still are maintaining those jobs. And so um, I hope there's this brighter side, and I haven't heard stories of this yet, but it's a theory that some of them might be a little bit more creative right now with a little bit more extra time at home, able to um, spend a little bit more time advancing their craft. And when we get together on Zoom and we hear about um, people who are making Lego animations or um, advancing their painting practices, we hear some of those glimmerings, which is really exciting. Well, Lars, we have quite a few people who have jumped into the conversation. Great. Um, our first question is, have you been able to communicate with other maker spaces throughout the state? And what does this say about the state of maker spaces today? What are you yeah. seeing and hearing? Great question. So early on with uh, Julia Hansen over at FAB at CIC, which is a small maker space um, in the Cambridge Innovation Center down in uh, Boston, we were able to connect and say, hey, look, you know, as, um, as we become aware of these gaps in PPE supply, what can we be doing, right? This is like same question we we're asking ourselves internally, but at a group level. And we very quickly stood up a, a, a network of maker spaces that um, we could start sharing information and coordinating action. Um, there was a lot of chaos at the beginning, you know, some people printing 3D printed respirators and things like that. And um, it was hard to kind of discern what was going to be the winning candidate solution. And so we didn't necessarily vet solutions with other maker spaces. It was like, hey, you know, let a thousand blossoms bloom kind of thing. We know what we're going to try and do. And then with those maker spaces that were doing something similar, we started talking about supply chains. Oh, where are you getting your polycarbonate? Oh, where are you getting this, that, the other thing? And what I think the lesson of that is um, there is a latent resiliency network baked into maker spaces. And the only reason we're able to do what we're doing today is because thousands of people have made a $50 donation here, a $100 donation there, to ensure that we exist at this moment in time today to produce these thousands of units. The group learning that's been going on in an informal setting through maker spaces is ripening today in front of our eyes, right? And so I think that's the big lesson is that prior to COVID, makerspaces might have been seen as this community amenity. Oh, really nice to have and kind of fun. Whereas if you talked to probably a dozen medical facilities, retirement homes, um, community health centers, they would say the ability of makerspaces to provide PPE was essential. And so it's exciting. Because of your ability to sort of shift gears on a dime and you have naturally innovative people who were um, unlike a major factory that would have to think long and hard and have major board discussions and decisions and right. cost analysis, you were ready to just jump in. Andrew yeah. Anselmo um, has written a question. Will artists be able to continue? Will, will artists be able to do their projects in the future if the lockdown continues? Larger art projects require a lot of collaboration. How will that work at Artisans or at other locations? I think that's an interesting question when it comes to larger projects and lockdown, right? Um, to the extent that a physical space is required during a lockdown, it probably won't happen, right? That said, I think the, there is a lot of excite, exciting opportunity to be figuring out how do you use, um, you know, Autodesk or how do you use SolidWorks? How do you use some of these tools to even sketch up, right? To dream and envision large group works online. The question about how do you actually build them and how do you install them on site somewhere? I think during a lockdown is, is a tricky question, but it's also not a tricky question. If we're on lockdown, we're on lockdown. And artisans won't be encouraging artists to build together. 
That said, if we find allies, for example, at the Mass Cultural Council through the Boston Arts, and there is a formula and a recipe uh, for doing this work safely, um, and it's seen as essential to the public good, which I actually think could be a really interesting conversation to have. And, you know, um, art is public good during a time of health crisis, right? I mean, it inspires us, it informs us. Um, that could be really compelling, but I think we would only do that work if we were doing it in collaboration with other actors who really understood um, health and safety, um, who had the financial side covered and things like that. I you hope know, I answered that in the right way, but. Well, I think you also, in the context of answering it, brought up this really critical connection between health and art. Um, health and art in terms of the way that you're responding now, but also um, art as a protective factor um, against many, many um, health uh, issues, everything from depression and, and a lot of the issues that are the result of loneliness and isolation, which is yeah. the cure, unfortunately, for the coronavirus. But I have a feeling that when we come out the other side of this, we're going to have a, a lot of people with uh, trauma from that, with anxiety from uh, depression, having been holed up for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. And, and the arts are really going to be part and parcel of their recovery. Um, yeah. Another question that uh, we uh, have been sent, uh, is there anything you'd like to see from the broader community that you are not yet seeing? You know, that's a great question. Um, my head is a little bit down right now, I'll confess, um, in terms of both sustaining our PPE teams, which are doing incredible work, and figuring out our long-term operations and financial strategy. So I haven't really kind of looked up and, and, and developed a set of high expectations for public engagement. However, I think the big invitation would be to experiment with us, right? I think none of us know what a post-COVID world's really gonna look like. Um, and so being willing to take risks on online events, for example, like. Uh, we don't know if a community build is going to work, right? Um, online is an online event, but come on, give it a try with us. I think, you know, being willing to experiment and adapt and, and treat this post-COVID world as sort of a primal matter from which new art forms, new forms of expression and collaboration might arise would be really important. But I do thank the public for the support that we've gotten today. We have 70 volunteers. 67% of them are new members. Oh, okay. We didn't know about them or they weren't members before we opened up our doors to volunteering in very, very specific ways. A lot of our new donations, 48% of new don donations are from new people. And so um, deeply, deeply grateful for the support that the public is showing for what we can do right now. You mentioned online. Um, and by the way, um, technology is something that we're all having to kind of wrestle into our control instead of being the victims of. Um, yeah. And we're all learning. We all have to have a lot of forgiveness as we all learn along the way uh, how to use Zoom and everything else. But there's a couple of comments that have come in around the yeah. issue of online classes. Um, are you doing online classes? Uh, what kinds of online classes are available? Is that still part of your program? That's a great question. And yes, we are. Um, experimenting with online classes, it's, it's essential. Um, you know, we, we haven't figured out some of the nuance like pricing for an online class looks different than a face-to-face -face class. But um, if you go to artisansasylum.com slash classes, you can see a few of the ones that we're offering. Um, one of our members, um, Alex Kreese, has um, put up a stop animation class, for example. There's another one on how to make um, cranky sculpture, kinetic sculpture out of um, around the house parts. Um, so our members are thinking uh, really creatively about this opportunity and um, again, being willing to experiment with us and our education coordinator, Anne Wright, who's doing an amazing job rethinking our education model for this post-COVID world. So we are thinking about that. It's not dialed in yet, um, but again, come experiment with us. <laughs> Now, of course, one of the best parts of Artisan Asylum is you get to play with all the equipment and so forth you have there. And so are you starting to think ahead about sort of this gradual unlocking um, and making available um, the space and the equipment that you have? Yeah, we're definitely 
thinking about that sort of, you know, as the governor has indicated that staged opening, um, we're not ready to sort of share or put out that plan yet. But I would say when we, if I had to look at the outside horizon, it's going to be the first first month of the new fiscal year. Probably July is when we can start really expecting to see um, kind of what looks like recognizable operations. We might not be accepting new members, but we will be allowing members to use our shops, things like that. So we'll, we're working on getting that plan out, um, but we're not quite ready because we don't really have a go date and I don't want to get put expectations ahead of delivery uh, quite yet. So, so I think this is a, this could be a tricky question, but sure. let's just, let's just go with it. Right. Um, you made a very intentional, distinct change in your business model and the nature of what you do to respond to COVID. Are you going to be able to completely go back to the original purpose and mission? Or do you think that this, um, how am I trying to think of it, sort of public service in, uh, in attention to a, another issue? Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, you- Absolutely. You gonna, are you gonna be able to turn away from that? Or is that now gonna sort of broaden the way you think about the work you do and that you might be looking for this type of opportunity or service opportunity in the future? under the umbrella of your um, original mission? Yeah, it's, a, it's an essential question, Anita. It's a really good one. And the way I would answer it at this point today with available information is yes, absolutely, we'll turn away from it. However, implicit in that answer is a recognition that this work could very well spin off as its own separate business entity right? Um, I think what's essential to recognize is the only reason we can really do this right now is because we don't have members coming in seeking access to our equipment, to our facilities, right? If we did, it would be disaster. We'd have everybody all over each other, no quality control, and my head would probably explode on your screen. Um, however, what we have found is that there is a need for this, there is a business case for this, and if the right entrepreneurs stepped up and said, hey, we want to take this somewhere, we would do everything we can to support them without actually owning it. I mean, I keep thinking of your design of everything from face masks, which I have a feeling we're gonna be wearing for quite some time to come, even as the world starts to open up a little bit. I think there's a lot of places that it's, for months probably, we're gonna be wearing face masks. Could you yeah. please make a flattering face mask? Oh my goodness, we have, Email whoever wants a flattering uh, face mask. Definitely email me, um, <laughs> Lars Torres at artisansasylum.com. Oh, so we can I'm that totally in. doing this, Lars. If you've yeah. got, I want it. <laughs> oh my God, we have. I didn't even talk about the home-based crew. So artisans isn't formally supporting this group, but there's a group of probably two dozen, well, maybe a dozen amazing fiber artists who are making beautiful masks. If you go to our Instagram page, you'll see one of our volunteers wearing them. They're making gorgeous masks. We will put one in your hands. Oh gosh, I would die for a gorgeous mask. Yeah. This sock I'm wearing is just not cutting it for me. Okay, done. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's an example of something, again, now we're into this sort of, a, uh, sort of ethereal question of is it art or is it a mask? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. wearable art. I mean, uh, this kind of merging and fusion of, um, medical gowns and devices and you know uh, accessories that are they art or are they medical yes <laughs> <laughs> now this is going to be the fun part right <laughs> yeah for sure now that we're used to it how do we play with it exactly yeah. exactly now i hear you um, we just have about a minute left, Lars. Okay. Um, any final words for the good of the order or anything you want to remind people in our last uh, 30 seconds? Um, well, thanks for joining. Certainly, it's, been, it's really fun to have this opportunity to kind of step out and think about the big picture. Um, absolutely stay safe. Um, thank you for all the work um, you know, that you and everyone else are doing to, to stay home at, at these times when that's really important. And um, I can't wait to see everybody when we're through this. Lars, you are doing amazing work. Thank you for joining us and telling your story. 
and use space. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.